In this week's drive, we feel the thunder in German streets. Celebrate a hundred years of perfection. See what it takes to be fit to race. And feel a twinge of conscience. All this and more in this week's Drive. The business and motorsport worlds are to join forces in a new international racing series, the A1 Grand Prix, billed by organizers as a World Cup of Motorsport. This will marry a unique business model with high-speed excitement and is the brainchild of His Highness Sheikh Maktoum Hasha Maktoum Al Maktoum, a member of the ruling family of Dubai. Juan Pablo Montoya was one of many key motorsport personalities who attended the launch. The series will be run in warm countries during motor racing's off-season and will start in September 2005. The series will see up to 30 identical single-seater racing cars built by Lola and fitted with 3.5-litre, 485 brake horsepower engines and entered under the flags of individual countries. The order for the 30 cars is believed to be one of the largest single orders in the history of motorsport. Organizers said that Dubai, Bahrain, Qatar, China, South Africa, Malaysia and Australia would host the first races with possibly two more venues to come. You could have India winning the World Championship, you could have uh, Italy winning, you could have United Arab Emirates winning. So everybody the same. The only difference would be the driver and what the team can get out of that car on that day, on that track, by setting the car up. But mm -hmm. they cannot touch the engine. Uh, they only could do some alterations to the tyre pressure and the aerodynamics of the car. Already, 23 countries want to enter teams. The business model sees each team as a franchise of A1 Grand Prix. The owner of the franchise, or seat holder for his nation, will be able to focus on running a profitable business with income generated through sponsorship, local media rights, merchandising and prize money, while A1 Grand Prix will provide the infrastructure for the championship, provide the cars and engines, handle the transport of the cars and ensure maximum television and media coverage of the races. I think it's got a few unique features which, which give it a very good chance of being successful. First of all, it's a winter series, which is brilliant. Uh, it's a Nations Cup, which is very interesting, and it's going to reach countries which, so far, maybe haven't had um, a, a really good, um, uh, powerful single-seater uh, series so far. And um, I think if the nations get behind it, it could, it could be enormous success. Ben Devlin, who's been racing a Lola in American sports car races, has been testing the prototype. Um, it's very hard to tell. It's at very early stages, but from the torque of the power and the handle in the car, it's got so much potential, it's going it's to be awesome. Um, there's a lot of, there's obviously a lot of championships now through the summer and people are scratching their head what to do but over the winter you can't beat seat time so this is going to be an excellent opportunity for anybody. Lola is the world's oldest and most successful manufacturer of race cars from Formula Nippon in Japan, Champ Car in the US and Formula 3000 in Europe. Over in the US, 160,000 race fans packed the Bristol Speedway for the sixth race in the 36-race NASCAR series. Though the race included 11 caution periods, it got off to a clean start. Ryan Newman started on pole with Jeff Gordon beside him. But on lap 59, Jamie McMurray tapped rookie Casey Kane. That was enough to spin Kane and send him into the outside wall. The second caution period came when the drive shaft broke loose from Brian Vickers' car on the 68th lap. It forced Vickers into the pits for over 100 laps as his team replaced the transmission. Brian finished 123 laps down and credited with 35th place. Jeff Burton and Kevin Harvick touched slightly on the 101st lap, which spun Burton, who was in turn hit by Bobby Labonte and Ken Schrader, generating another yellow flag caution period. On lap 169, Ricky Rudd had a tyre go flat, and he hit the wall and veered into the unlucky Casey Mears. With just five laps left, Dale Jarrett and Scott Wimmer touched, sending Jarrett into the outside wall and brought out the red flag. NASCAR decided it would be better to bring all the cars in and let track workers clear the debris so that the race would not end under a caution flag. The race resumed with a mere two laps left. So many, too many folks have reminded him of how long it's been since he's been. Kurt Busch led to the finish, but 120 laps from the end, he had refused to stop for fresh tires and made his worn rubber last to the end. Checkered 
flag, Kurt Busch. He said later he didn't realize at the time that the other cars that didn't pit were a lap down. But he won anyway on a track that seems to be his second home. Over to Europe now, where the 2004 German Touring Car Masters, or DTM series, was launched to racing fans in Hamburg's Town Hall Square with a traditional season opening presentation. In the spring sunshine, some of the loudest cheers were, unsurprisingly, reserved for the entrance of reigning champion Bernd Schneider. Heinz Harald Frentzen has also decided to follow the well trodden path from Formula One to DTM. This season, Schneider remains with Mercedes alongside another Formula One convert, Jean Alesi, as well as Britain Gary Paffert and last year's runner up, Christian Albers. Audi return a decade after the V8 Quattro took the title, with 91 champ Frank Bieler making his DTM comeback. And alongside star driver Heinz Harald Frentzen, Opel boasts 2002 champion Laurent Aiello, as well as last season's third place finisher Marcel Fassler. Drivers come from Switzerland, the United Kingdom, Sweden, Denmark, the Czech Republic, Italy and the Netherlands. The 10 race series will take place at tracks in Germany, Portugal, Italy, the Netherlands and the Czech Republic and the series begins at Hockenheim. This is, without doubt, the most famous name in motoring. And this month, the company is 100 years old, founded when the Honorable Charles Stuart Rolls was introduced to Frederick Henry Royce. 100 years on, the company remains true to their ambition of excellence and still builds the best cars in the world, with the Phantom launched last year. Rolls was killed in an aircraft crash in 1910, but Royce would stay with the company until his death in 1933. Royce had only one year of schooling and an incomplete apprenticeship, but studied at night to become an expert on electric street lighting before starting an engineering works that built electric cranes. But at the end of the 19th century, a depression made him look to the newfangled motor car for salvation, and his demand for excellence was renowned. Strive for perfection in everything you do. Take the best that exists and make it better. When it does not exist, design it. In fact, the Rolls-Royce company is now owned by Germany's BMW, although they prefer to use the expression custodian. The car bodies are built in Germany, but shipped back to the all-new factory for fitting out in the time-honored Rolls-Royce tradition, by hand and by skilled craftsmen and women. Indeed, it is the tradition and the stories that go back a hundred years that are the backbone of the famous name, and here are a few. When Rolls-Royce cars were first exported to America, they were so quiet that officials at first refused to believe that they were petrol-powered thinking that they were electric and running on batteries. In 1911, company chairman Lord Ernest Hives drove the very first Phantom from London to Edinburgh in Scotland, locked in top gear. 66 years later, the same car repeated the feat, having outlived its original driver by two generations. One woman drove her Rolls-Royce in top gear for 25 years because she didn't know how to change gear. Many think that Rolls-Royce follow in technology, but the 1924 Silver Ghost had anti-lock servo-assisted brakes, a feature being touted as a technological advance by lesser manufacturers 60 years later. At the factory, the cars are called Royces, or perhaps motor cars. They are never, ever called rollers. And did you know the end of the dipstick in a Rolls-Royce engine is carefully honed to ensure that it does not scratch the inside of its tube, thus creating metal shavings that might fall into the engine? The hides used in modern interiors come largely from remote parts of Scandinavia, where the lack of fence posts and barbed wire means less chance of flawed leather. High-tech cutting methods have replaced more conventional ones, but the accuracy is still legendary. To test the durability of early seats, Rolls-Royce used squirming Irma, a 200-pound artificial backside that wriggled in the design up to a million times. Over 50 meters of leather piping is used to trim the carpets and seats in a Rolls-Royce, cut from the same color-matched hides that are used for the upholstery. The name Rolls-Royce has often been borrowed illegally to imply goods or services of high quality, but it has been used with approval just once. Henry Royce allowed the Bruff Superior motorcycle to be advertised as the Rolls-Royce of motorcycles because after examining one, he felt it deserved the title. T.E. Lawrence, better known as Lawrence of Arabia and a Rolls-Royce owner, was killed on a bruff. 
Modern safety requirements mean that the wooden dashboards of modern cars are no longer made from solid timber, but consist of a thin veneer laid over a honeycomb sandwich of impact-absorbing material that will not cause any bodily harm in a crash. Rolls-Royce personnel travel incognito to Lombardy to buy walnut veneer. If it was known where they came from, the price would surely go up. The left and right sides of a Rolls-Royce dashboard are mirror images of each other, made from the same piece of timber. Because many customers order cars with personalized interiors, very often company craftsmen need to fabricate unique parts, such as drinks cabinets. Thus, the woodworkers are a key part of the team which completes the cabin of the car. Walnut is the preferred finish, although customers can specify almost any finish they desire. The sheer size of the new car is impressive. It's 5.8 meters long, has 3.5 meters between the axles, and is 2 meters wide. Threading it through London takes us past landmarks like Harrods. Buckingham Palace, where many of its predecessors have done sterling service. The Royal Albert Hall, in weather that seems as British as the Phantom itself. And on to the Ritz. It may not be a classically beautiful car, but it certainly has great presence on the road. One little indulgence by designers. Notice that the RR badge on the wheel hub stays right way up. Why? Because such things are important to Rolls-Royce owners, I expect. There will be a series of Phantom variants, including a convertible, an even longer wheelbase, and an armored model. Production has risen from one car per fortnight during 2003 to the maximum capacity of five cars per day reached by November last year. The 500th Phantom was built in January. Rolls-Royce's Goodwood factory can build up to 1,800 Phantoms annually, but the company hopes to sell only 1,000 examples each year over the life cycle of the vehicle, expected to be well over a decade. That's in line with historic Rolls-Royce production, which has built only 100,000 motor cars in the last century. The world's major car factories build more than that each week. The new model also has independently opening rear-hinged suicide doors, or as Rolls-Royce prefers to call them, coach doors. More than half of all Phantoms built are expected to be sold in the US, with at least 15% bound for the Middle East, and 15% to be sold at home in the UK. There are umbrellas concealed in each rear door very appropriate for a car built in Britain, given the usual British weather. The Phantom weighs 2,485 kilograms, but thanks to a purpose-built 6.75-litre 48-valve V12 engine and six-speed automatic transmission, it sprints from standstill to 100 kilometers an hour in 5.9 seconds, with a top speed of about 240 kilometers an hour. Rolls-Royce used to say only that their engine's power output was adequate. Nowadays, they answer coy. The Phantom produces 338 kilowatts, about double that of a high-performance Subaru WRX, at a huge 720 newton meters of torque. There is no tachometer. Instead, there is a power reserve gauge, which measures in percentage how much power is left in reserve. The newest car from Rolls-Royce is the seventh model to be called the Phantom. The most exclusive was the Phantom 4, of which only 18 were ever built, for heads of state and royalty only. The list of owners includes the Shah of Iran, who had two, the Sheikh of Kuwait, who had three, and General Franco of Spain, who also had three. The Queen of England and her sister had one each, while others went to the Prince Regent of Iraq, the Aga Khan, and Prince Talal al Saud Rial of Saudi Arabia. The world's most famous mascot is well protected, hopefully for another hundred years. This is the Red Square, with the Kremlin and St. Basil's Cathedral in Moscow, heart of Russia. It's also the home of the world's newest Rolls-Royce dealership. Once the center of communism and a place where a display of the conspicuous wealth that a Rolls-Royce plainly represents would be unthinkable. Yet, here it is, purring across the cobblestones where once the mighty Red Army paraded before the leaders of the Soviet republics. A Rolls-Royce is a rare sight in Moscow, but the carmaker hopes to change that very soon. 
A centenary celebration event at Russia's historical museum was organized to launch Rolls-Royce cars in Russia. Russia's economic growth in the last four years has seen a rise in demand for luxury cars, with German models like Mercedes-Benz, BMW and Audi taking the largest share of the sales. It's because this economy is growing. Uh, it's because uh, Russia is changing. Russia, in getting, on the one hand, is getting closer and closer to the uh, modern Western type economies. On the other hand, Russia is very uh, uh, devoted to the luxury goods. And people do understand what luxury is. They uh, do understand the value uh, and they trust this value. And that's why Russian luxury market now is booming as well. So that's our start point and we think that a Russian market could be the most potential market in the continental Europe for all stories. Communist leader Vladimir Lenin used this 1919 Rolls-Royce Silver Ghost, demonstrating perhaps that all people are equal, but some are more equal than others. In fact, Lenin ordered nine motor cars, and at least three still exist. Another of them is the world's only Rolls-Royce fitted with half-tracks, so the father of the Russian Revolution could get about in the snow. Lenin loved his cars. By night he slept in barns, by day he traveled like a millionaire. Another famous Russian had his last ride in a Rolls-Royce. Rasputin's body was taken to be dumped into the river Neva in Prince Felix Yusupov's sidelight cabriolet. Rolls-Royce hopes to follow the lead of its sister brand Bentley, who opened a showroom in Moscow last year. Joined at the hip since 1931, the two supremely brutish luxury brands are now separately owned by Germany's BMW and Volkswagen. We have been waiting for a long time for this new Bentley. We placed the order last September. We had hoped to get it quickly, but we didn't, so I hope it will be this year. The Phantom has self-leveling air suspension and rides on 20.5-inch alloy wheels and is the first car in the world to feature Michelin's run-flat tyres as standard, which may be a good thing on Russian roads. More than 60% of all the Rolls-Royces ever built are still on the road. An extra kilo or two here doesn't matter, because it's all about building the strength of the driver. Despite all the aids built into racing cars, especially in Formula One, peak physical fitness and supreme stamina are needed, as well as great strength in very specific areas, so that total concentration can be sustained for long periods. But building muscles is not enough. There are specific aspects of fitness that need to be honed to perfection. Motor racing is an endurance sport that strains your muscles in quite a specific way. So first of all, the sort of training that racing drivers, especially Formula One drivers, need to do is stamina work. On top of that, however, because of the G-forces and the way you sit in the car, there's also a lot of strain on your muscles and you must build these up. Therefore, you need someone who knows all about fitness training and in particular how to create the right combination between muscle work, normally done on bodybuilding machines, and stamina work such as jogging, swimming, running and cycling. Training for winning. Drivers who aren't supremely fit will start flagging towards the end of the race. Extreme centrifugal forces in long, fast corners make the helmeted head weigh four or five times its normal weight and a flopping head is a sure sign of a tired driver. Most drivers have extremely muscular necks. Ralf Schumacher knows that he has to stay fit and he trains every day. Because we normally have to race in high temperatures, concentrating hard for two hours at a time and at full throttle, it's very important. It's also important because in pressured situations and fast corners, some drivers forget to breathe. That doesn't happen to me, but all the same, it's amazing how fit you have to be. Motor racing is about brutal physical stress, as the car is built to go, stop and corner as fast as possible. Driver comfort is not an issue in racing car design. Then there's the heat. A cockpit has no air conditioning or ventilation, and the driver's sitting between two big radiators and inches from a screaming 900 horsepower engine, wearing dense, flameproof overalls, boots, gloves and a hood. Even a fit driver can lose three litres of fluid, that's three kilograms in weight, during a single race. 
I do a lot of sport. I do cycling, plane squash, windsurfing, you name it. You know, ride bikes and you know anything that is you know pretty exciting and and fun to do. I'll do. Drivers need mental fitness as well as physical. Formula One drivers concentrate totally when they go out on the track. They have to because Formula One doesn't forgive mistakes. However, the final result isn't only down to the driver. The whole team is tuned to perform on race day. The pit crew practice their all-important tasks hundreds of times. Here, as well as on the track, it's a question of hundredth of a second. But there is one advantage. They don't have to go to the gym, even if they had the time. They don't have enough spare time to do specific fitness training, but it's pretty, you, you, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to be a race mechanic and not be fit, simply because you do work very hard. It's, it's a much harder job than most people realise, and the hours, the working hours are way above average, so those guys are pretty fit just by virtue of that. This proves that motorsport, especially Formula One, is very much a team sport, and physical fitness is one of many important keys to success. Drivers are athletes who must maintain their minds and their bodies in peak shape for racing and testing throughout the year. And finally, just a bit of a tug at the conscience of motoring enthusiasts. Mexican officials are searching for a solution to a unique problem, the proliferation of millions of scrap tires along the US-Mexico border. Officials say discarded tires in the border towns of Tijuana, Ciudad Juarez and Mexicali are the result of the area's population growth and demand for used American tires. Ciudad Juarez, with its population of 1.2 million, is a working class city with one of the highest crime rates in the country and growing unemployment. When it rains hard, the tires tend to fall, so we need some help. And we would like these tires to be picked up because it is a risk for all of us who live here. Tires are almost indestructible. They're made up of a mixture of over 300 different chemicals and include steel wire, oils and fabric. They're expensive to recycle, are not biodegradable and exist in their millions around the world. The city's ecology supervisor, Jesus Maldonado, said that piles of millions of tires are a fire hazard. Although there is no record of a major tire fire, the Ciudad Juarez Fire Department reported 300 fires involving tires between 2000 and 2002. Well, it's definitely a risk. It's hazardous to make fences out of tires because of the danger it represents, that someone around there could set them on fire and there would be a blaze. Fires in tire piles burn intensely and are extremely difficult to extinguish. In 1996, Mexican firefighters battled a major tire fire in Tijuana for days. The plume of black smoke blotted out the sun and toxic particles spread through the air, reaching California, appropriate since many of the discarded tires were first used there. There is a possible plan with Chihuahua cements to use the tires as an alternative energy source, which would be the most viable thing and the most cost effective. The city generates more than 800,000 scrap tires per year, but the Mexicans are working towards recycling them. Let's all hope they succeed. So, whether you're testing a new series, getting out of line, or rolling up at Harrods, so you stay on track and up to speed, make sure you catch next week's Drive.